Hello and welcome to That Encyclopedia podcast with your hosts, Will and Jacob. Hello. So, Jacob, I've got a very exciting topic for you today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not unlike all of our other topics which are exciting, so if you haven't listened to those, go listen to them. Today, well, it it would be hard to completely categorise what we're talking about today. What... How do you really determine what is a hoax? There's a question for you. What is a hoax? Yes. Uh, It's actually a very uh, discerning question. Um, Of course, Wikipedia would define a hoax as a widely publicized falsehood so fashioned as to invite reflexive, unthinking acceptance by the greatest number of people of the most varied social identities and of the highest possible social pretensions to gull its victims into putting up the highest possible social currency in support of the hoax, which might be the most elaborate definition of anything I've ever come across. <laughs> um, what, but why, why are hoaxes relevant? Uh, people who've clicked on this would assume, if they don't know what it is already, that we're talking about some sort of ancient book. Um, yes. So, the name of this podcast, as you will have read, is Voynich Manuscript. I mention the word hoax, not because I'm confident that today we are talking about a hoax. No, that's where this gets a little bit complicated. I mention that word because I'm not sure if we are talking about a hoax or not. <laughs> so, the Voynich Manuscript is... A well, it's a manuscript. It's a book. It's a handwritten book that s- sort of came into written history around God. What, <laughs> what year was it? I forgot. <laughs> uh, early fifteenth century, according to carbon dating. But I think it well, was first recorded like uh, yeah in the in the seventeenth century. But probably yeah. created in the fifteenth. Yeah. So yeah, that was my. <clears throat> the point I was going to start with is this book sort of came came into the know and we have knowledge that people knew about this book just over a, over 100 years after it would supposedly have been written according to carbon dating and it's a book an illustrated book in an otherwise unknown writing system colloquially referred to as Voynichese, although I, I, I don't I don't like that name. It's a bit cheesy. Mm. But you should certainly have a look at whatever background images we've chosen for this episode because it's got an interesting uh, an interesting style to the writing and it's a language which to this day we don't understand. We don't know what it means and we don't recognize it. So the question is is this a legitimate lost language or was this book written as an experiment in some form of uh, cryptography cryptology cryptography uh, or is it a hoax that was deliberately written in uh, to be deceiving so you know what I'll, I'll hand it over to you at this point i'm sure you have something interesting to say <laughs> I am brimming with excitement to talk about the Voynich uh, Voynich Manuscripts. I called it the Voynich Manuscript for years. Uh, This is actually something that um, I've been familiar with for at least a decade uh, because it ties in closely to uh, cryptoanalysis and linguistics and uh, more recently in my life with uh, things like topic modeling and statistical um, decryption methods, which are all things that I engage in with my actual work um so when you unite that with constructed or unknown languages it's like uh, my perfect um uh, source of excitement and uh, i called it voynich for years because i the the word looked sort of germanic uh, to me but um it's named after a polish lithuanian uh, antique book dealer called Wilfred Voynich. Um, the spelling V-O-Y-N-I-C-H is the uh, anglicization of his original Polish surname. Um, so it is Voynich and not Voynich, as I have been saying. And if I say it incorrectly, it's because I'm trying to unlearn a decade of bad habit uh, over the course of 30 minutes. Um, 
it is an exercise in something, right? Uh, in fact, the first thing I'd, I'd suggest is for everyone to go to the Yale University catalogue website. We'll include a link in the description. And if it were up to me, probably the whole cover slide for this video would just be that link with a load of arrows around it, uh, each saying click here, like um, uh, a hmm. scam or something, because it's, it, it's something that you just have to see firsthand. And it is all freely available um, online, scanned in very high quality for your viewing pleasure. The book itself is, well, it, actually, you're not even sure kind of how, how many pages there are, because a lot of the pages in the codex are actually larger sheets of vellum that unfold into anywhere between two and eight times uh, uh, the size of a single given page. So it's around 240 but you could argue that it's more or, or or less depending on how you look at it um and every single one is littered with both linguistic and artistic detail although i must say um if you zoom in on the yale website at the illustrations you can actually see that the um dyes inks pigments used for colouring the vellum is quite, they've been quite crudely, it's been quite cr crudely done. There are lots of holes, things go outside the lines, not everything is even attempted to be coloured in. Um, so the, the, the drawings definitely add to its aura of mystery, particularly because they are frequently of stars, planetoids, and especially uh, herbs that are not identifiable. But really, it's the language that has always fascinated me. Um, and the book also has, to top it all off, a fascinating history of possession. And I think yes. it's, its <laughs> age is, is what makes this the magnum opus of weird historic mysteries. Um, I think yes. it's it, it's it's strong in in two senses. Firstly, it's it's definitely a document that exists. It's not something like um, maybe cryptozoology where people are like ah oh, Bigfoot exists and so forth. But really, there's there's you know there's no solid evidence for that as far as I'm aware. Um, but the Voynich manuscript is a physical book that you can go and view in the Yale library properly with permission and certainly for free online and secondly because it was made uh, almost certainly about 600 years ago um, to the year actually uh, it's it's the impressiveness of the commitment to completing it becomes exponentially um uh, or, or grows exponentially so that would be my kind of stream of consciousness which is probably quite appropriate considering how the manuscript is actually written uh first thoughts on the voynich manuscript um but will am i right in thinking that you weren't really familiar with this document before it was um selected for the podcast no i i've definitely heard of it and i've definitely seen some of the illustrations before but far from familiar, no, and I didn't didn't know very much about it. I think I'd heard of it um, more along the lines of I, I think I thought that it was a hoax, but I've read more about it now, and I'm uh, pretty intrigued. Mm. Is is this what you found the most? Uh, riveting then as from your sort of outside perspective because there's so much we could talk about i could literally spend hours on this is yeah. the is the question of whether it's a hoax or not well in the, that's the, what's ties, most interesting to you yeah it, it sort of that does interest me um it, well it interests me the most to think if this is if it is real who wrote it uh, in what language and what's it all about and also sort of tying in with the what's true and what's not true um, as you mentioned the, the the timeline of who's allegedly been in possession of the manuscript is also pretty interesting 
because apparently it was once in the possession of the of Rudolf the Second, Holy Roman Emperor, King of Hungary and Croatia, King of Bohemia, during <laughs> during the year uh, sixteen sixty five or sixty six. Yeah, no, that would have been a yeah uh, kind of si- beginning of the sixteen hundreds ish. Yeah, yeah, around that time, apparently mm. it was in possession of the Holy Roman Emperor, and yeah, I don't know if that's necessarily true, um, but it's hard to know what's true with this book. It could be true. It's certainly an interesting book, and what's more interesting is that people have come up with various theories about who could have made this hoax who could have written this uh, false language and when they could have done it but from uh, modern analysis we know that it must have been made a a couple hundred years before even Rudolf II could have had it so (laughs) who knows I'm not personally I'm very unconvinced by any theory about a specific so what was it Uh, Giovanni Fontana there was one theory that he let me let me read so he is an Italian engineer he has some illustrations that are known to be his that slightly resemble illustrations in the Voynich and he was familiar with cryptography Although, I think it would be very easy with something like this to just find a random person who's well documented and be like, oh, it was probably them. But even if it was faked, um, if you're going to call it that, I don't know that it would necessarily just be whoever, whoever you can conveniently point at. I don't know that we really have any evidence to say it would be him. I mean, there's a there's an image on the Wikipedia page of one of his drawings. Um, frankly, the skill level in his drawings <laughs> looks better, is greater than in Voynich manuscript. So, uh, I encourage you to have a look yourself. Hmm. Absolutely. I mean, the earliest history of the possession of the manuscript is what we're least certain about. Um, the radiocarbon dating is a fantastic benchmark because it it doesn't i mean technically speaking it doesn't disprove when it was it doesn't prove that the manuscript was created uh then it proves that the vellum was created then but it's possible that the writing on the vellum was done uh many years later although uh i believe academic consensus is that it is extremely unlikely that such Uh, material could remain um, blank and intact for any significant length of time Um, and so it was almost certainly uh, written and created uh, at the same time of the vellum. Um, From uh, entering Rudolf II's uh, imperial library its ownership is a little bit more concrete and it spent a most it spent most of its history at the Collegio Romano, um, which was a Jesuit um, repository, um, before uh, eventually making its way to uh, Wilfred Voynich. Then, after his death, it passed to his uh, widow uh, Ethel, and on her death, it passed to Ethel's friend Anne Nil, who gave it to an antique book dealer. Uh, Han, uh, another one <laughs> Hans uh, P. Kraus and uh, Kraus tried to sell it and amazingly couldn't get anyone to buy it I don't know if this is because Kraus like wanted a lot of money for it uh, or whether no one was genuinely interested but it was donated eventually to the Yale Library where it's been kept safe and protected ever since um, I it makes me wonder um, if I started browsing the offerings of modern antique book dealers, what mysterious documents I might find uh, if things like <laughs> this can be 
unsellable, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I would pay so much money to have the Voynich manuscript, although it is probably for the best that it's kept, you know, in a proper air-conditioned room. I don't know how you preserve ancient manuscripts, but it's good that someone knows how. Um, so do you do you do you think it's a hoax then? Um, because there are there are it, it's not it's not completely meaningless. I think that's important to stress. Um, it, it's not just gibberish text um, for almost 300 pages with several fold outs and completely random and indecipherable images. The manuscript itself is actually divided um, into uh, five. Um, let me just see here. Yeah, uh, six different um, uh, sections. Um, so it kind of begins with um, descriptions of herbs and plants, then moves over to astronomy and astrology for um, a while. Then it goes to the, the lost art of balneology, which is the treatment of disease through bathing or otherwise just washing yourself. Uh, then it goes back to more general cosmology. Then uh, herbs make a triumphant return, but this time in objects and containers resembling apothecary jars. Um, so this is termed the pharmaceutical section. And then finally, <clears throat> the final pages are dedicated to full uh, text pages broken into paragraphs with stars marked in the left uh, hand margin. And so this is called the recipes section. So the uh, assembly of the pages is, is not random. And the linguistic analysis, um, or several linguistic analyses, plural, um, that have been uh, applied to the text over literally hundreds of years at this point, have found some interesting results, haven't they? Yeah, they have. Uh, although I was hoping I could ask you about these. <laughs> oh, oh, no, go on. <laughs> I'll, 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 <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give my understanding of things. But firstly, yeah, I'd like to note this seems to convey information uh, it's some sort of very old medical textbook. In fact, that was one of the... Uh, someone has certainly theorised that that is the, the meaning behind the book. Is It's got information pertaining to health, um, and in particular, women's health. Although, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot... There's a lot of little drawings of of ladies scattered throughout the book in particular in the uh in the bathing section <laughs> but, you... yeah, there, there are lots of little quirky drawings i'm just imagining some monk scribing literally hundreds of drawings of naked or semi-naked women <laughs> and someone going yeah. why are you drawing uh, the, the the same nude woman nymph like figure like a hundred times on this really high quality vellum is like it's uh, for women's health. <laughs> like, yeah. <that's> <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there definitely there definitely is like um, a running theme with the illustrations. But there's more to there's more to it, isn't there? In terms of you saying it's not gibberish. We know we have some a bit better, a bit more evidence than just the pictures seem to follow from one another. Yeah. The text itself, from certain analyses, which I'll ask you to explain better if you can, <laughs> yes, um, tell us that this is, in some ways, this text is uh, very similar to real languages and real books in terms of how it's structured and that would indicate that uh, at best it would have to be a load of gobbledygook that was structured in meaningful sentences of some sort yeah um so, so yeah so yeah so the, the 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 first thing to note is that uh, the the characters the the words in the text can be divided into uh 
well-defined characters um, and for the sake of uh, codifying them through machine analysis you can assign uh, a to a character b to a character and so forth but that's not to say that it represents that character it's just for the purposes of analysis um, and when you do this you can assign um, a letter to every letter of the English alphabet um, except W um, and some but not all letters have variations that could be considered capitals in the sense that they are clearly simple uh, stylistic changes to ultimately the same character. Uh, Wikipedia has a good chart for this but personally at, at least at a cursory glance I find some of it a bit arbitrary for example I can't distinguish at all really between the lower and uppercase E characters and if anything I would argue that the lowercase C which doesn't have a capital equivalent functions like a capital E um, but it's all a bit arbitrary. Once you've done that codification you can perform all sorts of weird and wonderful linguistic techniques uh, onto them and people have over the years applied pretty much everything I could think of. Um, it's important to note that the characters are not randomly distributed. They do follow a sort of Zipfian distributions in the ratios that certain letters come up. Certain letters only appear at the beginning. Uh, certain characters only appear at the beginning of words. Others only at the end. Um, others are relegated only to appear in the middle. And... <clears throat> uh, in terms of the relative frequency of these characters, some can be identified as vowels, um, or not literally vowels, but uh, how you would understand a vowel in terms of its importance and necessary frequency of appearance in a text like this. Um, furthermore, using uh, techniques like uh, topic modeling, um, we can also argue that the script could actually be two different languages or two different ciphers, however you want to describe them, uh, Voynich A and Voynich B, um, which are again divided between these different sections. Voynich A um, appears in the herbal and pharmaceutical sections, whereas Voynich B appears in the balneological um, and more cosmological um, slash astrological sections. Um, topic modeling uh, just for everyone's information, is an exciting, reasonably new uh, technique of natural language processing whereby you co-opt uh, co um, not a full AI but sort of a self-training uh, computer model um, to uh, uh, compute loads and loads of text uh, which has been compelled into dictionaries and it will tell you which words or phrases called topics are associated with each other um, in a way that uh, implies meaning so for example you could uh, you could use it to identify verbs related to physical activity uh, that might appear together in a news article about sports whereas um, words relating to players like uh, like their names or their positions or titles would appear in a different topic so it's a, a way of classifying meaning and it does appear to work on the Voynich manuscript um, but there are loads of asterisks next to this and with any sort of statistical model it's important to remember that any input data will produce something <laughs> regardless of how good a model it is. Like, a model is not good just because it exists. Um, George, the statistician George Box uh, said that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Uh, and I think it's important to keep that in mind. So although it is exciting and promising, and topic modelling has helped us identify uh, certain things like different dialects or variations of what is, uh, at first glance, uh, a single text or single language, um, it's not the same as saying that it's definitively not just gibberish or not just a hoax. In my opinion, um, by no means an expert, but having uh, being a bit more familiar with the analysis and um, uh, and this being an area of great interest to me, I am not convinced it's a real language. 
I really, really want it to be, but I think it's just a really elaborate hoax. Um, although perhaps hoax is a bit of a loaded word because it suggests it's a uh, it's trying to trick you into you know something, um, and I don't think it's trying to do anything. It looks to me like a, an exercise in calligraphy in art in illustration and just someone's passion project because there are again about 240 pages each one filled to the brim with drawings and text um it clearly took a while to to create and maybe that maybe that it maybe its existence was the objective just to have something so i i think it's really interesting but i I, I I don't think it has meaning. Or, to finish off my tra train of thought here, it might be something steganographic, calling back all the way to our first episode on Bible codes, um, where there is some sort of cipher, but you need a middle um, agreed upon um, reference point, like every third character or every fourth character on every second paragraph and without that arbitrary rule there's no way to decipher it because if you impose your own arbitrary rules and like okay let's assume it's every second character let's assume it's every third character you are going to return meaningful data uh, basically especially in a text this size so you would need to know from a different source what the uh, steganographic middle cipher was um, so if it is steganographic it's not possible to decipher without that original code. So it is functionally a hoax to us, which is a shame. But Although I, yeah. I would be interested by a sort of steganographic deciphering method that, although this is far from perfect, but took into account how one might interpret the illustrations and attempts to find uh, any set of texts that seem to most reasonably per pertain to those illustrations and then to see how coherent <laughs> it appears to be. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you, uh, have you reached a conclusion, um, a tentative one yourself? Do you, do you agree with me or do you think that it's potentially some language, mm, real or yeah, constructed? Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's difficult to disagree with you. I, I don't uh, I don't know that, as you said, I don't know that it would be a deliberate hoax. Seems like an Im immense amount of work, and I'm not really sure where where the motive w would be <laughs> for that hoax, or even like the belief that it would work. I mean, I'm pretty sure if I spent however much time as it would have t taken to to write this to produce a similar thing i mean i would imagine there's a lot of gibberish that's just been lost to the ages yeah <laughs> um although it is interesting that it, it it's been so challenging to decipher oh yeah um but yeah i don't i'm Unfortunately, it, it's difficult to to see how it could be, to see where where the real language could have come from, given that it doesn't seem to have come up everywhere anywhere else, and yet this book is clearly from fifteenth uh, century Europe. So, yeah, it's it is it might be a hoax, but I think it is one of possibly the best hoax of all time <laughs> like <laughs> it, it could easily be the work of multiple people I, I i personally like to think that a group of monks were bored and got together in an abbey somewhere in italy or what would become italy mm. and just like in their free time chose random like started with these characters because there are defined characters they're very well sieved um and just had some sort of uh, cipher system to choose the characters but not to assign meaning just to to go through them in a way that was weighted uh, in terms of their distribution and just worked on it in their spare time do i have any evidence for this no 
but <laughs> no one has any evidence for anything else either so uh hmm. that's my that's my head canon for the voynich manuscript a truly thrilling mystery and possibly uh and possibly the work of a madman or, or woman like uh that was a, a a suggested theory that it was some sort of delirious person's uh stream of consciousness although it seems too careful uh to be like yeah. me but yeah yeah it, it seems like a, a a long time in progress type type deal mm. but yeah uh very very interesting and i think it's definitely worth if you're interested in throwing your own opinion in the ring you should read about the section on the language hypotheses um a lot of people have claimed to have deciphered bits and pieces but they're all (laughs) there is there's a a disturbing amount of time is dedicated to all of these people who said that they deciphered it and every single time it just says this is disproved or this is this is doubted or whatever it's and that's really what 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 makes it so interesting and and a little more challenging than just saying oh yeah someone obviously faked this with a simple cipher like we we don't really know what method was used to create this language um and i'm not i'm not really sold on the steganography thing it it feels uh, that feels like a sort of cheeky excuse for not being able to de- to decipher it in my opinion because it does seem like it's a lot of work that's been put in and it looks very thematic and i don't know why they would have bothered <laughs> if, if it's just a, only only one in three letters has any meaning i don't know mm. it just seems a bit strange to me true but it's possible it's very very difficult to prove or disprove mm. Well, I think that's probably all we have time for today. But please do check out the Voynich Manuscript. Again, it's free to view, all scanned digitally and uploaded to uh, the Yale University Library website. Uh, Completely accessible, worth uh, half an hour or so of your time. And once you've done that, why not check out our other podcast episodes as well? Different topics every week. Thank you very much for listening. See you next time.